Uh, my next guest was a, a student at Stowe School in Buckinghamshire. He went on to have a, a varied career as a, a punk rocker, a cowboy in Australia, police officer as well. But he discovered late in life that he was dyslexic and he then uh, found a way of overcoming his dyslexia and developed a form of note-taking called Smart Wisdom, which became a business. Jonathan Kemp joins me in the studio. Your story is so common, isn't it, Jonathan? We hear this over and over and over again, particularly people, dare I say, of your generation, um, roughly in their 50s, who went years and years and years undiagnosed living with dyslexia. Yes, I'd agree. It's very, very common. Uh, probably actually people from about the age of 30 onwards, I'd say. Um, and while at school, th there wasn't the facilities there or the specialists to assess us, so we had no idea. I think back to when I was at school, I can think of at least two people in my junior school who I'm sure were dyslexic, looking back now. And they were the ones who were considered to be slow or, or who struggled reading, but they weren't lacking in any form of intelligence whatsoever. They just were mis- um, diagnosed, misjudged. Yes, it, it's interesting you say that because often the common feature about people with dyslexia is people say actually they're really bright but they come across as being a bit slow and that's in a traditional education sense. And you can often tell someone if someone's dyslexic because they'll get easily distracted, you know, their, their eyes will sort of wander out to the window and to the far beyond. Um, and also as I did, quite often they'll become disruptive. How disruptive did you become? Well, only a little bit, of course. But I, I did become a punk rocker right. and shaved all my hair off, much to the horror of my family. What do they make of it in Stowe School? Because it's a very august institution. It, you're right, it is very august. Um, I think they were a bit bemused. Um, I did actually put a poster of Never Mind the Bollocks, Here's the Sex Pistols up in my window. You are quoting an album yeah. title now, I should make it clear to uh, recognise the language there. But of course, yes. Um, I'm surprised that uh, the school didn't pick up on it because of course I mean, they, they were part of a generation of schools but obviously it's a top school. Did, looking back, do you not feel that they, they should have spotted something? I think again, you actually hit the nail on the head. In that generation it wasn't something people really thought about. So if people were struggling, they were struggling and they went into the bottom set. Yeah. There wasn't actually a facility to help them get over it. And there was almost like a vacuum ceiling above that. Once you got hauled into that bottom set, there was no way to swim out of it, was there? No. And um, basically what would happen in certain subjects, you would just have to keep trying to retake exams till you pass them. And if you're living with dyslexia, then it's ever diminishing returns, isn't it? You're, you're just always going to struggle. Yes, and certainly for myself and also for people who currently aren't dyslexic and don't know they're dyslexic, you don't actually know why you're struggling. It's interesting you talk about sort of sounding slow because you were telling me just off air that you have a habit of having to literally process a question before being able to answer it. So what's going on in your brain at that moment? So it's a really Right now, just I've asked you just, that long-winded <laughs> question. Fantastic. Um, people... If I take one step back, so people often associate dyslexia with reading and writing. Um, but for a lot of us, it's also about processing the information. So, for example, um, you asked me a question. And if I don't initially understand it, what I'll do is I'll sort of slow what you say down. I'll repeat it slowly in my mind. And then at some point, I think, ah, oh, yes, that's it. Got so it. what is actually happening at that point? Your, your brain is saying, whoa, overload. Yes, it's like, exactly as you say, I, I feel this sense of overload. It, it's like a challenge. I suddenly think, I've no idea what this person is saying. <laughs> but at that point, I'll start slowing it down, repeating it back to myself and really identifying the key words. And then from that, I can get the understanding. Do correct me if I'm wrong on this, but there is a, a body of evidence that, that links dyslexia to mental health issues as well. And, and it kind of makes sense insofar as, with things like depression, if your world is looking muddled, you're going to feel muddled. It's that constant sort of swimming through honey feeling. Did, did that happen to you? Did, did it impact on your on your general well-being? Yes, for definite. And I think actually I like your analogy of swimming through honey. Um, I think that's quite appropriate. But it, it does for definite because one, one of the effects is you, you feel sort of slightly less than. It impacts your confidence, impacts your self-esteem. And particularly if you're in an education environment or a work environment, those key, those skills, you know, the confidence, self-esteem are key. 
So it does have a negative impact. Yes. So let's flip this around. The moment that you realise that you've got dyslexia, um, while being a diagnosis and no diagnosis is ever a happy day, it must be quite a happy day because it, it must suddenly um, allow a lot of things to make a lot of sense. You, you're completely right. So I was diagnosed... Well, I went for a formal assessment when I was 48. And, Catching it early there, obviously, Jonathan. Uh, very early. I'm an early starter, <laughs> as they say. Yeah. And... Um, it was a three-hour assessment. And what do, what was, do they do when they're, when they're trying to assess for dyslexia? It's, it's a good question. So there's a range of tests. So they're, they're testing things like your numerical skills, your ability to understand new information, your um, conceptual skills. So can you move shapes around into logical positions? So there's a range of tests. And the reason for doing this is that dyslexics often have a challenge in one or two areas but a high skill in another right and it's the difference between the two that causes the problem okay it's, it's, it's the disconnect between what you should be able to do based on your on your baseline and what you actually can do is that a fair description yes that that, that is definitely one of the impacts so they tell you you're dyslexic well, what do you then do with that do you, do you then uh, once you've realized that it explains an awful lot do you then look at how to live with it going forward yes i think You've described two things. One, it made suddenly made my sort of upbringing and my career path make a lot of sense. So a lot of people with dyslexia do join things like the army, um, nursing, police, because they are under this misconception it's all about people. Can I, do, they find can I do a really unprofessional thing yeah. and just go back five minutes because the thought has just come to my mind and, and exactly it's going to annoy that. me if I don't... Okay, if I don't. please do. Um, so rewind and then we'll go yeah. forward. Just, just going back to... To your schooling because you obviously ended up in a in a, a high quality public school you'll see the link with what you're saying in, in okay. a moment i'm interested to know the story behind that because was there an element of your parents not understanding what was not going right for you and they thought that by putting you in a high powered expensive school it would sort you out or would you always have been in the kind of family environment that would have been destined to go to public school does that make sense um, yes it was the latter okay yeah. So it wasn't they thought that it wasn't they were despairing at trying to find a, a way for you to to learn better, be less of a rebel, and they stuck you in a, a public school. It's just you were always in that in it, that was always where you would have headed. Yes. Well, actually, funny enough, I was supposed to go to Eton, right. which is where all my family had gone. Yeah. But I failed the uh, failed the exams. They must have loved you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Back to where we were then. So so post diagnosis. Yes. Um, and you um, you know you're 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 making sense of what went before. What goes after? So I think what went afterwards is it enables me to understand where I operate best and it also enables me to not give myself a hard time. So, for example, if I'm learning something, I will give myself maybe time and a quarter, time and a half, particularly if it's sort of more on the education type learning. Practical skills, I'm really fast. Isn't it interesting, though, that when you hear someone like yourself living with um, a disability, that actually the life lessons you've had really should apply to all of us um, about knowing your limits, being kind to yourself, working within um, your your sphere of reference, working with within your own limitations, um, uh, communicating with others as well, being being honest about where your, um, your your barriers, your boundaries lie. This can apply to all of us. Yes, and I, I completely agree with that. Uh, what's interesting for me is I never really talked until quite recently about the fact that I'm dyslexic. Um, I'm not really quite sure why, but certainly now I'm much more open about it. And as you say, the advantage of being open is that you can then share your experience and get support. Uh, your experience led you to create Smart Wisdom, um, an online university in effect, uh, based on well, the notion of, of memory techniques. And let's be honest, memory techniques of various descriptions have been around since the Romans. Yes. Well, actually, funny enough, the Romans were very good at all of this. They had because, to remember where all their roads were. Well, exactly. <laughs> um, and also they were great orators as well. So you're quite right. What I did, I actually went to... I didn't go to university after I left Stowe. Um, I worked as a cowboy in Australia, and then I joined the Met Police. And... Uh, I went to university in my 30s and I knew that if I just did what I normally do, I'd struggle. And that's where I developed smart wisdom. So it's a really simple form of note taking, um, can be learned in less than a day. And what it enables you to do is to manage and understand and control information. 
teach us it in two minutes. Can you at least allow us to understand the, the root of it. OK. So what happens is when people... We can save 400 quid in the process. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'd like to understand better yeah. what it is. And save 400 quid in the process. Um, so what happens is, it, traditionally what would happen is if I'm taking notes, I will listen to what you're saying and I will record either in full or in part exactly what you're saying. And because people speak quite fast, there's a chance I'll start to get left behind. Um, what happens with smart wisdom, instead of recording everything, you focus on what are the important points, and then you take those important points and then you link them together. And it's by just identifying the important points and linking them together that increases understanding for dyslexics by 23%. So it's the understanding of what's being said to you as opposed to helping people to read better have i got that right you've got it a hundred percent so it's not just re if we read better it means that well for myself as a dyslexic yes I, I i hear what you're saying but this is about really understanding at a deep level what's being said so it's appropriate for people who find themselves in academic situations uh in jobs where they have to be scribbling down information like journalists or police officers or or all the such like or radio presenters yes <laughs> listen i could probably do do we do in the course even though i'm not uh, dyslexic my yeah. my my, uh, my brain is uh, is scrabbled but in a very different way and, and that's why i was making the link as well is that obviously there's a massive difference between living with dyslexia or not but 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 we all have parallels in our in our day-to-day -day stories don't we yes and i think again you you've described it really well one of the things that was described to me when i was assessed was we're all on what they call a spectrum and you know, dyslexics are within that spectrum and everyone is within the spectrum. So we all, exactly as you describe, we all face the same challenges. And anyone who thinks they're not on a spectrum is on a spectrum, as someone <laughs> said to me uh, on this programme a while ago. And I think there's there's a, a fair amount of relevance in that as well. Um, uh, Julie says that both my children have dyslexia and I had to fight the school to get them diagnosed. Both have gone on to be successful young men, although it's still very unrecognised in some schools. And that's a shame, isn't it? Yes, and... I would agree with the lady. It's still quite common that people aren't diagnosed. So the classic signs for me is somebody always saying, oh, gosh, my child is, you know, they're bright, but they're quite disruptive. Yeah. And the teachers don't think they're very bright. And for me, those are classic signs of dyslexia. Quick last thought. Um, is dyslexia less sexy than it was 10 or 15 years ago? By that, I mean, I speak to someone who's a school governor and we look at special needs of varying descriptions. And in the last five to 10 years, a whole raft of new special needs have, have become, I would say, fairly prominent in what schools are looking for. And whereas 20 years ago, dyslexia became part of what we were looking for, it then became part of, you know, it, almost, it was almost used casually, dyslexic, the term used casually. Has it lost a little bit of its prominence as other childhood learning difficulties have become more prominent? I would say it's it's become more balanced. So that the key is if if someone is struggling, whether in education or the workplace, then it could be a number of issues of which dyslexia is one. It's part of a of a holistic approach to understanding the the, the route to these problems. And and that makes a huge difference for everyone. So um straight off the bat, the course does cost four hundred quid um to learn this this smart wisdom technique. Um what if it doesn't work? Well, I've been training people to use it for uh, 20 years and it's always worked. We've had it tested by scientists and they found that it increases your understanding by 20%. What I would like to say, it's <coughs> £400 for business people, but it's only £99 for students. That's really important. If you want to find out more, um, the best place to go is to the uh, Smart Wisdom website, which is www, well you've guessed it, <laughs> dot smartwisdom.com uh, if you want to find out more and it will take you to the Smart Wisdom University uh, where you can uh, look at the details of the course and see if it would be a benefit to yourself or perhaps uh, one of your children or grandchildren who live uh, with uh, dyslexia. It's been nice to meet you, Jonathan. Thank you very didn't, much. Didn't go into the cowboying in Australia, which I think Maybe might, next might, time. might have been a, in 20 seconds. So it was deep, deep in the outback. Deep in the outback, kangaroos everywhere. Oh. Um, one of the best times of my life. They call it God's country, and quite rightly so. It's magnificent, isn't it? Nice to have met you. Good luck with, you. with your project.